Welcome to Fintech Insider Focus in association with Visa. Our once insular world of financial services is now a global phenomenon, and there's people everywhere opening up new markets and discovering new challenges like never before. In this strand of Fintech Insider, we take a burning question from financial services across the globe and put it under the microscope with explainers, expert panels, and in-depth interviews, all to bring the global community into focus, which is where the title comes from. This month, the question that we're getting stuck into is, how does agriculture and fintech collide in LATAM? Now, there is so much tied into that short question, so let's start with an explainer. Agro may be currently the hip abbreviation by those around the industry, but the practice of agriculture and farming in Latin America goes back more than 10,000 years with the production of maize corn by indigenous communities in Mexico. Today, agriculture is the backbone of the LATAM economy, with soya, maize and avocados exported to countries across the world, earning the region the nickname of the world's breadbasket. In fact, 75% of soya, maize and avocados exported and consumed globally are farmed in Latin America, according to agria.pe. Of course, all this trade means a lot of money moving across borders, as well as within the economy itself, through wages, seasonal employment, lending and trade. So surely the age-old practices of farming and financial services have become well intertwined at this point, right? Well, considering around 70% of LATAM population is unbanked, with no access to checking savings accounts, or underbank, lacking access to credit or, or loans, there is still a lot more that these two sectors can do to familiarise themselves and benefit people across the region. We'll find out more after a quick word from our sponsors at Visa. Visa's FinTech Fast Track program is streamlining the onboarding process for FinTechs, enabling them to gain access to Visa's powerful capabilities and network. Visa and their enablement partners help FinTechs launch and scale cards, virtual credentials, and disbursement programs. To learn more, visit partner.visa.com. Welcome back to Fintech Insider Focus. We want to get into the subject a little bit more, so we put together a panel of experts to really dig into the question. How does agriculture and fintech collide in LATAM? First off, we have my Fintech Insider Focus co-host for this month's episodes, Pamela Ceballos, who is the Senior Director, Digital Partnerships, Fintech and Ventures over at Visa. Hey, Pamela, how's it going? Hi, David. Thank you for having us here. No worries at all. Uh, tell me a little bit. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty impressive title. Tell me a little bit more about your uh, your role at Visa. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, so the organization I make part uh, is in charge of the relationship with fintechs and enablers, digital partnerships around the globe. And we're mainly responsible of driving commercial engagement with those fintech companies from developing tools and process internally to serve this type of clients, uh, to develop commercial relationship with them or co-create products or solutions for other type of clients. Very cool. I mean, it's a uh... Such a great time to be doing this. The the fintech landscape is uh, is broader and uh, more exciting than ever uh, in that sense. Uh, landscape. I was doing, we're going to be talking about agriculture, aren't I? Um, the, uh, that wasn't intentional, I promise you. But uh, we really should get into the show anyway. We're we're also joined by Etienne Gillard, who is the head of ventures over at Marmatech. Thank you very much for for joining us, Etienne. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having us here today. No worries at all. Uh, tell me a little bit more about Marmatech. So Manatech is the initiative from Moshe Mana. Moshe Mana is the Israeli billionaire who moved from Israel to uh, New York 40 years ago. He has been extremely successful in many, many businesses and uh, turned to be a real estate mogul. And, and many people in Miami know him because he, uh, he is behind uh, the success of Wynwood. And now he's going to transform downtown Miami into a tech hub. And Manatech is... Uh, part of the dynamic to transform downtown Miami, the 80 buildings uh, Moshe Mana owns in downtown Miami to transform them into a, a Silicon Valley of the Americas, so a tech hub for all the entrepreneurs of the uh, connecting the Americas uh, between themselves and with the rest of the world. 
Very exciting. I mean, uh, getting people to Miami, that's, uh, it's not, not too hard to get them there, but uh, <laughs> having all the infrastructure and everything to, to do it is a, uh, a very exciting one, as you say. So, uh, well, thank you very much for, for, for joining us on the show. Uh, last but by no means least, we have Juan Fantoni, who is the CCO and co-founder of Pomelo. Uh, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you, David. Great to be here. Well, great, great fear to have you on. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your role and, and tell us a little bit more about Pomelo. Yeah, L- let me start with uh, with Pomelo. Um, so Pomelo is a fintech infrastructure play for Latin America. Uh, we're in our third year of operation. Uh, we operate in the sixth biggest market of Latin. Uh, so far, we raised $63 million in venture capital from the likes of Index, Sequoia, Insight. Um, and this big world fintech infrastructure, let, let me let me explain it easier. What it means is basically any company that want to launch cards or issue virtual accounts in Latin America can do it using Pomelo's infrastructure in a much easier and faster way and also scalable through Latin America. Uh, and that all obviously includes agro fintechs that are building on top of our platform. Uh, right now we have more than 20 uh, in, in different stages, so very excited to be here. Um, me personally, I'm one of the co-founders and I, I lead uh, the business development and sales uh, operation at Pomelo, and I've been in payments and fintechs for, say, almost 10 years. Very cool. A, a great panel to discuss what we're going to be talking about today. Before we dive in, just a quick reminder, listeners, the views and opinions of the panel are their own and don't necessarily reflect those of the companies that they are representing. As always, nothing we say should be taken as tax, financial or legal advice. And basically what we're saying is doing your own research, which is always pretty sensible, isn't it? Uh, and with that little caveat, let's get on with the show. Uh, Pamela, how does Visa fit in with the agro or agricultural picture? I mean, why is that important to Visa? Yeah, great question, David. So I think first it goes with our purpose as a company, right? Our purpose is to uplift everyone everywhere by being be- the best way to be paid and to pay. And that by no means exclude agriculture, right? So they also have to do transactions, they need to pay, they need to buy from suppliers. So our objective is to add value and to be present in that part of the of the value change. And definitely by supporting the development of the Latin America countryside is fundamental for our strategy of empowering people and agriculture entrepreneurs. So they need also access to benefits, to digital platforms, to payment, to payments, accessing credit. So there's a lot of demands in the sector to actually drive and succeed. So that's where it plays a, an important role for us. And I think also as a company and more for us, uh, we definitely have a challenge challenge with the B2B payments. It is part of our objectives. So definitely agriculture plays an important role that we need to solve and to improve the experience of payments there. Yeah. I mean, when you when you say it's a, a, an important part, I mean, you know, agro more broadly f- for LATAM is, is huge, right? You know, we're talking about 25% of the regional GDP. Apparently, this sector accounts for more than 50% of regional exports as well. So, I mean, digitizing, you know, giving digital capability, giving digital financial services to that, uh, to that industry is hugely important, Pamela. Yeah, definitely. I think the needs of the sector in terms of payment are huge. And because it represents so much of the economy in Latin America, enable those payments will help the the region as a whole to thrive. There are more than eight countries already offering some solutions in terms of agriculture payments. And we have some of the most important countries in the region, such as Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, with a huge portion of their GDP uh, based in agriculture. Culture. So I think that's why it's a focus in the region. And we have not seen a lot of development in the past years in terms of advances in agriculture payments. But now I think it's an exciting time seeing all the fintechs operating in this space and what they try to achieve. So exciting times to be in payments and agriculture. Yeah. Well, and obviously, uh, uh, you know, we live in changing times uh, globally, you know, there's all sorts of things happening in various different regions of uh, of the of the world. But I mean, the 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 pain points, the the sort of jobs to be done of of each of those regions seems to be sort of shifting quite dramatically as well. So, I mean, is this a story about 
uh, again, you know, connecting people into the the digital systems, as in, you know, cash flow is always a problem, regardless of whatever size of business you are, right? Is this just a, a way of bringing people up to the speed with 2023? I think it goes beyond that. There is definitely a need for digitalization payments in the agriculture, but the needs at the pain points might be a bit different. Uh, imagine, for example, a producer that can only do one harvest at a year. So they they need the cash flow and the capital to actually produce that at certain time. So it's not that you can get the access to capital later in the year and that will solve. It, it won't. Like you have one shot or maybe two if you are in agriculture or something. So that's why their needs are so different. Also, the cash flow is different. Like they need to pay suppliers across the year, but they don't receive the payments throughout the year. So they need to have access to credit that adapts to their needs. So I think resolving credit lines is totally different, like other consumer or other business, financing requirements for the agricultural production and with the financial cycles of that production. And also is improve the control expand, like traceability of where are they spending, if those are the efficient ways of spending. I think all those needs are very particular to this type of, of business and are different from other um, other sectors that need digitalization of payments. But here, I think we have more clear payment points to solve. And that's why uh, we need different products and different solutions for them. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it is a very difficult market, isn't it? And farming, you know, is a tough industry more broadly, isn't it? I mean, Etienne, Juan, have you got anything to add to that? I mean, the 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 problems that these businesses are facing into and the the support that financial services can can offer, there's a there's a pretty big intersection there, isn't there? Just just to touch a little bit on what Pamela was saying. Agriculture and financial services, they can they the, the fit cannot be more obvious, right? Because you, if you think about the process, like you need to plant first. So like, like Pamela said, you need credit, right? Then you plant, you need to do payments. Uh, you also need insurance because, you know, crops uh, could, 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 could be damaged. And at the end, the, the farmer gets a lot of money w once a year. So then you need to have investments so that money, you know, doesn't lose their money, especially in Latin America, doesn't lose its value, the valuation the stuff. So you have, Credit, payments, insurance, investment, everything that, that financial services has to offer, it couldn't be more, more obvious in, in agriculture. It has been going on for many years, but in a very, I'll say, traditional and inefficient way. Yeah. I mean, the, the, meta the literal metaphors between financial services and the farming industry like a you know growth or growth equity you know what I mean it's like it's literal growth equity it's crops you know like so it's a you know there is a, there is a, an interesting overlap between all of those um, Etienne have you have you seen the 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 strains of the industry or the or the problems of the industry shifting over this period uh, well, uh, what I would like to add to what Pamela and Juan said is that also uh, we need more financial inclusion and many people are working on the countryside. So also that it's uh, that integration uh, between agri-food tech and fintech uh, will help that process. Uh, it will be part of the solution. We know that if we want to have successful communities and countries thriving, we need them to be bankerized. It's not because we want to control them just because it's better to have a bank account that to not have a bank account. So uh, th that's also very important and one of the reason of the many reasons why we want to be uh, in this because we want to have impact. And one way to have impact is also through that uh, perspective. Yeah. And I guess um, to, to that point, uh, I mean, traditionally, you know, and I, and I say traditionally, not even not even having to look more than a decade back. I mean, how is that relationship being typically manifested? Is it a you know um, digital is, is is in some means sort of replacing the uh, the empathetic with the generic? You know, in terms of a, a human interface to a digital interface, and that that isn't typically great. Sometimes, if you're to your point around inclusion or to your point around, I mean, even understanding, you know, particularly complex financial terms, 
you know, having a human interface for those things is actually pretty good for, uh, you know, breaking those things down and uh, and being empathetic to the the situations that, uh, uh, you know, people within this industry are really facing. So, I mean, how has the industry changed then over that period? Is it is it typically been something that's a, a branch-based relationship? I don't know, Pamela, do you want to start on that? No, I think... It- we have not seen a lot of development throughout the year, right? Like it has been a very traditional business. It was very uh, person-to-person lending or capital. And the exciting thing is I think with the fintech um, boom in the last years, we've seen a lot of projects in agriculture. And it's not that digitalization is going to uh, substitute those uh, person-to-person interaction is more that it's going to complement it with technology. It's going to give instruments that are really relevant and add value to the agriculture sector and also uh, to all the people working in agriculture to get more access to better financial services. So I think it's more complement on, te- on technology, on improvements that we will continue to see in the development uh, of this sector. Yeah. And I guess a a big part of that, you know, particularly when we're talking about more, you know, 2023, we're talking about digital businesses serving these. I mean, Juan, on on that point, I mean, every, I think globally, every great fintech is, is really the uh the the factor of serving a community and, and solving problems for a community. I mean, these types of communities are hundreds and hundreds of acres, uh, you know, apart from one another, you know, maybe hundreds of miles potentially in terms of the the scale of the geography that we're actually sort of talking about here. So, I mean, how how critical is community in, in that sense still, even at this scale? And, and how do you sort of navigate that when it is so uh, uh, proliferated in that sense? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so if, imagine in the traditional way, the, the closest bank branch is probably... 50, 100 kilometers away, right? So uh, that, that, that there's really need for this. But I will say the fintech is really, or digitalization, like I said, is really solving this. But the traditional fintech go to micro strategy that you know, we see, you know, paid media, download your app that works perfectly with a traditional fintech, that really doesn't cut it for this type of community. Uh, for different reasons, now that you have, you know, connectivity issues. Uh, you have trust issues, you have um, lack of digitalization issues. That's changing very fast. Uh, so, for example, you see more and more digitalization, more connectivity. But this trust trust factor, that what you say, like this one-to-one, is really hard to translate into a digital way. What we're seeing is uh, the companies that, that, are, that have launched products on top of Pomelo, what they do is they leverage existing relationships. So... Uh, for example, in, in Latin America, there's something more very common that's called cooperativas or cooperatives, which are organizations in each in each of these locations. So they, they leverage those communities as a go-to-market strategy with digital products, and the relationships stop there, and there that it follows on on a digital way. Um, we also see the use the, the the distribution, for example, the people set, selling seeds or or, or different instruments for the for the industry they leverage those stores and those relationships as a go-to-market strategy for this these digital products that start physically and then translate into a, into a more digital world yeah i mean it's 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 fascinating isn't it connecting people however far apart in order to to come together around the problems that they're solving it's a it's an interesting service in, in how you made that and and typically if, just as a side point i mean ha- what type of customers are you seeing uh, building on top of your platform, what what size is there? Anything that sort of connects them? Because I I guess as um, as agriculture becomes younger, as you know, it, hundreds of acres are being inherited as as uh, as part of the you know changing of hands of those things in the same way as what we're seeing in you know wealth space more broadly. Then then I guess the expectations of actually how. Uh, a, a younger demographic going into agriculture would expect to 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 operate, expect to work. That that must be the type of customers that are, are sort of coming to you for a, for the solution. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, t- just to be clear, so Pomelo is infrastructure. Then on top of Pomelo, you will have an agro fintech or different players that will go to that end consumer. But I would say that the the key the key word for me here is specialization. 
historically in Latin America, you, you probably had in each country one bank that was focused on agriculture. And then um, some banks have a business unit for agriculture. But right now, as fintechs allow to build products much faster, easier, and cheaper, you have very spe specialistic uh, players. So either fintechs that do only that, or, or to your point, that like big companies that were in the in the um, agriculture space, they do embedded finance. So they 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 launch products specifically. So what we're having right now is companies that are really specialized in agriculture. They really know agriculture, and that really can can they can provide much better and cheaper products to, to the to these people. Combined with what you said, new generation, way more digital digitalized in terms of on the on the agro side, are more open to to receive that. Yeah. And it's um it's amazing how expectations and this is something that's you know very common to that, but every slice of financial services is facing into that, is that you know, generational change, the expectations can go from you know zero to a hundred really, really quickly, which is uh uh, which is amazing. Uh, Etienne, uh, obviously, uh, I mean, I was going to say community building in Miami is going to be a lot funner than uh, than anywhere else in the entirety of the world. But I mean, how how big is community generation for, for and community curation for, for what you guys do as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't mention that uh, yet, but uh, we have a sister company. So we are Manatec at, uh, in Miami, transforming the downtown into the tech hub, international tech hub. But we have Mana Agro, which is another company from Moshe Mana, uh, a big amount of companies. And, and it's, uh, it's uh, Mana Agro, they are based in Colombia, and it's an agriculture uh, company and they own uh, thousands of acres of productive land. They are uh, implementing new technology. They are sharing those learnings with the small farmers. So, and although they have a partnership with companies like Microsoft to bring connection, connectivity to internet or to all the, the countryside. So really it's uh, all those kind of initiatives will help the uh, integration and the uh, acceptation of those kind of new services that we are bringing with the fintech. Uh, uh, space and and uh, also they are at Managro they uh, are the majority shareholder in Cropper.com which is a marketplace and if you have a, a fintech uh, a solution it's easier to use a marketplace of course and it's the biggest marketplace in Colombia and it's a marketplace for agri food tech so uh, for agro and uh, really uh, we are really into this <laughs> definitely. Well, as you say, it's um, you know it's an amazing growth area, isn't it? In that sense, but uh, and and actually, as you, as you said about the infrastructure side of things, you know, uh, Juan, when you were talking about you know access to payment rails, you know that base level of infrastructure is critical. But if you don't have connectivity, if you don't have data connectivity, it becomes completely for nothing, right? So, uh, and we've seen that again, you know, other parts of the world, you know, Africa particularly, the the better data connectivity is, the better chances that actually financial services can really get to solving real problems. So, I, I mean, I guess touching on those real problems then, I mean, how, how really can financial services encourage, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, very small businesses in the sense of the amount of people that are there and running them to to be successful because scaling when you're you're farming or or uh, and and Etienne you touched on this a little bit earlier on with the you know the complexities of insurances and you know and, and lending and you you know all the different things that are needed all the way through that value chain of um of a of a year in the life of a of a farmer so uh, what role do you think and maybe Pamela starting with you what what role do you really think financial services can play to help people scale I think they play a, a central role, like uh, enabling payments in a more efficient way for this type of uh, sector, but also for the people working in those sector will definitely improve the quality of life. They will give you access to more credit, to more data, to other financial services that right now are not enabled for them. So even having access with the products that we have on Visa Agro, we can also enable them to receive subsidies from the government, right? 
right, for agriculture. And what we provide to governments is traceability of those transactions. Where are the agricultures spending? What type of businesses? So they might be able to access to new credits or to new subsidies just because they are spending well enough those programs from the government. So I think when you lose that visibility of data or you were paying cash, that didn't happen, right? So I think we're giving more elements um, to create like this open banking for agriculture as well. Mm. I mean, it's interesting. We we talk about at 11FS, we often talk about digital riches. Like we believe if you're building a, a product for the future, it should be real time, it should be intelligent, it should be contextual, it should be human, extendable and social. I, I, I guess, you know, sometimes when we're talking about you know, helping people get a mortgage because you can use open banking APIs to connect to some data. Like the potential for de-risking lending through having much larger data sets on, you know, weather predictions for the next six months or 12 months or, you know, even real-time, you know, data sources from the crops themselves in terms of the fields. Like all of these things should and I guess could be used to, to really change how, uh, risk is perceived in those organizations and you know what types of covers what types of services what types of products should be should be delivered uh, Etienne, you were you were noddling along there uh, uh, vigorously so uh, what do you what do you think Yes, because I mean, actually, we are currently running a agri food tech program for a Latin American Series A companies trying to raise a Series A round, and um, from U.S. investors. And uh, among those two, uh, twelve companies, two of them are fintech companies. We have Agro Token, uh, which uh, Juan is uh, working with, so I will let him talk about the Agro Token. <laughs> and uh, we have Verco from Mexico, and those guys they are doing lending for small farmers and uh, helping that big problem they have. Uh, we, we, Pamela already mentioned about the, the financing of their, their business. No, It's not easy for them to get access to uh, the typical traditional bank uh, just because they have different uh, needs and, and uh, and they don't have m- maybe physical access to the bank neither. So, uh, and, and really fintech and solutions can really change, be a game changer for in many, many cases. Mm. Yeah. Juan, anything to, to add on that? Yeah, I probably would like to touch a little bit on, on what Dan mentioned, agro-token. I think it's a, it's a very uh, cool case of, of uh, something that, that's going on in Latin America. Um, so agro-token is basically a platform that's tokenization of crops or soybeans, probably name it. So the, the, the producer will, um, uh, take their, their, their harvest and, and get a token in change for the value of, of their produce. And they can use that instantly to make payments. So that we have, uh, the, the, they have a credit card that's powered by Pomelo. So they basically have their cross. They're not, they don't need to sell it, but they can pay for gas for their truck. Using using this token, uh, so very innovating innovating uh, types of, of companies that are happening in Latin America. Yeah, I mean that's um, super interesting. Essentially, allowing them to cash out, uh, you know, early to then bankroll their growth in that way, which is you know it's a, a good way of um, letting the uh, the cash flow. Uh, or getting the cash flow ahead of it, catching up in that sense. But I, I guess, you know, we've talked a little bit about smaller companies and obviously, you know, smaller um, uh, agro players, you know, getting into this space. H- how about the, the the biggest players on the on the continent? Because there are there are some absolute behemoths, aren't there, in terms of hundreds and, you know, thousands and thousands of acres that are being, uh, being farmed. Uh, how does that differ, I guess, Pamela, with the the level of service and that's not just uh you know somebody turning up to the farm to uh to 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 explain all of these things to you is it there's a a much greater level of complexity there for for serving those scale of businesses yeah it definitely is i think uh the needs might not be different in essence but the products or the services that they will need to access uh to those uh, services might differ a bit but i think the pain points remain the same. So what they are trying to look in, in a solution is for convenience, acceptance, visibility, control. So I think as long as the solution is designed for the needs of that segment in terms of sizing or what they 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 need to develop, I think we're talking about the same. It's just the scale of the business uh, and how 
can we solve it with different products that adapt more to their needs? But in essence, their demands were going to be very similar to small producers. It's just how we will land with solutions for them. Yeah, just a lot more zeros sometimes in that sense, uh, in terms of the scale of uh, Etienne, what do you think? Are the, are the problems different, the scale of organization particularly? Or, or I, I have to agree with Pamela. I think the, the problems are probably very similar, just the, uh, the, the deal size is just a little bit bigger. No, exactly. And what we see uh, more and more is that big corporations like uh, big farms with uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of land are partnering with uh, startups because they want to bring new technology. They want to want to bring new, new ideas to those traditional ways of, of producing uh, food. And, and that's very cool. And really that connection with corporate, it's something that we are totally uh, on, on top of that because because we think that it's the uh, nice acceleration of, of those small uh, companies that are bringing new ideas and then they can face very quickly the reality of the needs of the, 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 the those big companies and scale up if it makes sense. So that's uh, very important. Yeah. Go on, Juan. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to add something. Not only the big uh, farming companies, but the big agro companies that are either selling products or providing services to, to the different uh, agricultural players in Latin America, I see a big shift in that sense regarding to financial services. So this whole wave of embedded finance where like every company will add financial services to their to their value prop, I've, I've seen especially strong here. So for example, you know, the, the companies that sell seeds, um, they're building their own banks inside. And these banks will, will be much better suited to bank the, the agriculture population of Latin America. Yeah. I mean, if you really understand people's problems, you're always really better at solving them, aren't you, in that way? And it's uh, I, I say this anywhere in the planet, actually, the big banks started just solving a problem for somebody and then look, got really successful. And then hundreds of years later, they're, you know, they're doing lots of things for lots of people. And, you know, sometimes it takes the people sort of reminding them of what that that vision is, what that problem was that they were solving to to get back to that in that way. And and so much of what we talked about to, today in terms of the community side of things is is really critical to that. I mean, Pamela, I mean, you've got the luxury of working in an organization that's supporting organizations doing this kind of around the world, right? Like you you must be able to kind of look at other markets uh, to learn some of the the lessons or or even some of the challenges that are ahead for uh, for for LATAM in in this space. Yeah, we do. I think it's definitely one of the advantages of being a global company to learn from others. Uh, I do have to say that Latin America is pioneering a lot of solutions. So we might some sometimes we actually share that uh, with our colleagues, right? And uh, working in a company where our contribution in the agricultural sector is to actually. Uh, provide better, more secure technology for the million people working in this type of sector is very regard regarding for all of us in the company. And we definitely feel the need to continue investment in this sector and uh, to develop better and better solutions for them. Nice. I love that. Lots to learn, but lots to teach other people as well. Like, uh, that's, a that's a great message. I, I guess for, for all of us, and, uh, we're, we're sort of rapidly running out of time. I know we could talk for, a, for, for many more hours on, on this, but future gaze with me for a little while. If you, if you look out maybe, let's say five years in the future of, of what the sector looks like. And look, we're sitting in the, the space with all of the innovation and the technological adoption and regulators changing and opening up more and more and, you know, changing hands of farming and, you know, it, what, where do we think we're going to get with this? What's going to be the, the breakthrough innovations that will really change the industry? Uh, Hein, should we start with you? Yeah. Uh I mean, I, I, I touched a little bit uh, about this with, when I talk about our token, but I, I really think tokenization of assets will really transform this, this industry. Um, right now, what we're seeing is tokenization and payments with, with that, but I think that's just the beginning. When you see the, the potential of blockchain uh, applications in, in, in tokenization assets, but then smart contracts and all we can do with the, those assets when they're tokenization, they can fundamentally transform this industry. Uh, so there it's, I think it's a, um, something very obvious. And secondly, more and more specialization, right? 
companies and products building technology and fintech specifically for agro. Uh, and that will bring a lot more competition than right now we don't have. Like farmers don't have a lot of options. When we get a lot of competition in that area, that will bring prices down and, and, ser- and bring services up. So that's uh, how I see the future. Yeah. No, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? As you say, the tokenization of physical assets, you know, at the moment we're seeing, you know, pictures of apes or, uh, you know, highlight reels from the NBA or whatever. But the, the, the real opportunity, as you say, is de-risking a value chain that is 25% of the GDP of a, of a continent. That's, that's a pretty, pretty important thing, right? So, Etienne, what do you reckon? Five years out, what are we going to see? Well, I mean, it's extremely difficult to foresee in the, the future. No? And every, every time we try to do that, we, we are totally wrong. But definitely, I mean, people understand the, the evolution of the technology like a straight line going up. Uh, and it shouldn't be like that. It's going to be a hockey stick. So at some tipping point, the, the revolution will be amazing. And we are, will, every day we will have like a, a new chat GPT revolution, you know? So, and things that are really coming uh, to affect uh, all our world today. We cannot imagine the world without internet. This is this uh, session is possible thanks to internet. Uh, 25 years ago, it would uh, wouldn't have been possible. So uh, really, and, and it's going to be we are going to experience an acceleration of that, and we are just at the beginning of that technical uh, technical revolution. And um, uh, really, uh, in the coming years, all the aspects of our lives are going to be uh, affected by this revolution. And, and of course, agri food tech, of course. FinTech will be at the upfront of, of, of that uh, uh, amazing uh, story that we are going to live because really it's, it's going to be impacting from so many, so many aspects of our lives. So it's going to be very exciting times. Very good. Paolo, what do you think? Like uh, big times, big changes, lots happening. Where are we going to get to in five years' time? Yeah, a lot happening. And as you mentioned, David, uh, it represents around 25% of the GDP of the region. So we could only expect that more and more companies start to focus on this uh, to solve the different need, right? I think we're going to see more exponential growth uh, in the solutions that we see for the producers, for the farmers, for everyone involved in the value change. And definitely, we have not solved all the pieces of the value change in, in agriculture. So I think we will see more solutions also in different parts of uh, of the ecosystem that at the moment are not really uh, the focus of some companies. So we will see more developments there. I mean, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? It's um, it's so easy often to forget how in critical agriculture is to the planet. Do you know what I mean like we we all eat stuff? You know, what I mean, like, and and I guess the I, I would be terrible at predicting where we would be five years from now with within this industry. But one thing's for sure is we're predicted to go from eight billion people to nearly eight point five billion people. That's another five hundred million people who are going to be wandering around this planet if we don't get agriculture working really effectively in LATAM, but everywhere else around the world. We are screwed, like in a major way, and uh, and the the fintech, the financial services part to play in that is really really critical. So, uh, anybody listening to this didn't think agriculture was important? Well, it is, and you've just learned a thing, which is great. And that probably wraps up this week's edition of Fintech Insider Focus uh, in association with our friends at Visa. So, thank you so much for the panel for joining me. Uh, where can people learn a little bit more about you and your companies? Etienne, starting with you. So manatech.com, there you can have, also you can send an email to info at manatech.com. And on June 15th, we will have a demo day with uh, 12 amazing companies from Latin America, and two of them are a fintech companies. So if you want to have a sense of what we are doing, just uh, uh, register to, the, to that uh, event. You can send an email to info at manatech.com and we will send you the, the link. Very, very good. Uh, Juan, where can people learn a little bit more about you and your company? Yeah, so you can learn in pomelo.la or on Twitter or LinkedIn, Pomelo Latam. Fantastic. Pamela, where can people reach out to you? Sure. So reach out at visa.com, but for sure, reach, reach me directly in LinkedIn. I'm happy to work with a lot of fintech to learn more on the ecosystem and connect you with the Latin America fintech community. 
Fantastic. As for me, you can always find me lurking somewhere on LinkedIn. So uh, feel free to connect with me over there. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. If you like what you've heard, subscribe to the podcast and don't forget to leave us a review. It helps us make it better and helps other people find the show as well. For more on this discussion, look out for the next episode of Fintech Insider Focus in two weeks time. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.